Good day, everybody. So today I'm going to give you an abbreviated lecture discussing science and the scientific method and scientific literacy and some of the uses and abuses of that. So before you watch this, you probably ought to go ahead and watch that 20-minute um, John Oliver video that I posted for you, uh, the link in there. Um, turn down the sound so your mom doesn't hear the bad language. Um, but uh, it's just a, a, an interesting look at how media and the general public read scientific studies. All right. So let's get right into this then. So when we talk about science, we use that word. The first thing we have to do is, okay, figure out what that is. And it's just more than anything it's just this process we use for understanding the world for explaining how something works or why something happened or why we think something will happen in the future uh, but we don't just take wild guesses or just make all sorts of strange claims we actually need to have a process that guides us through mm -hmm. this understanding and, and uh, how things work and that that process needs to guide against making mistakes or uh, letting personal biases interfere with our uh, scientific studies and our uh, and our conclusions do that that's all based on uh, carefully designed experiments and how we validate uh, the things that we believe So, as I said, make sure you watch that John Oliver video on science and the media just to so that you have an understanding of what we're as we move forward. So the scientific method has been around since uh, the seventeenth century, which is the you know eighteen hundreds, right? And when science got, when most of the sciences got started, all the sciences, when they get started, it's all about describing, right? All the kinds of birds on the world, or all the chemicals in the world, or all the atoms, and all the geological rock forms, and those kinds of things. And then, so you've got to collect this huge amount of background knowledge. And so that's, in the early stages of any particular science, it was all about describing and, and descripting and, and labeling uh, what things were and how they were. And then from there, as that science matures, you move into uh, systematic observations, which lead to measurements and experimentation. And then we start to then look at uh, formulation of hypotheses and testing those hypotheses. We start to look at applying those sciences in, in very different ways. All of you have had the scientific method fed to you in junior high school or in high school there's a bunch of different ways to do that essentially some people say it's a five-step process some people say it's a six-step process some people say it's a flow chart uh, but all of them contain the same elements right the first question is the first part of that the scientific method, you gotta ask a question you can't study something let's say huh how'd that happen why is that like that what's going on there you gotta ask a question and after you ask the question, right, well, if you're looking at this model, then you'd start looking in the books. You start doing searches on Google. Does anybody, has anybody answered that question before? Right? We skipped that step in here, but that's okay. Let's say nobody's answered that. We can't find any information that answers our question. Then our next step is a form hypothesis. That's just simply, we're going to take the, the best educated guess we have about what caused that or about the answer to the question we ask, right? And the more educated you are in that field, in that science, the more information you have in that science, the, the more likely you are to come up with a valid hypothesis, a hypothesis that may be uh, a possible explanation. Um, if you don't know anything about birds, it's pretty hard to make hypotheses about how come birds fly south for the winter if you don't know anything about birds and geology and life cycles and anything else. And so you've got to have some, the more background knowledge you have, the more educated you are in that field, the better suited you are to make a, 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 
to construct a really good hypothesis because a hypothesis not only has to present a possible explanation, a possible answer, we also have to be able to conduct an experiment to test that hypothesis. A hypothesis doesn't do us any good unless we can actually run scientific experiments on it. We can test it to see if it actually is true or not. And it's that experimentation, the way we do the experiment, that's kind of where all the details are, that we've got to design that experiment very carefully. We've got to, before the experiment starts, know how we're going to collect the data. We have to know beforehand how we're going to analyze those data, right? We have to have the process very laid out and make sure we're eliminating all the uh, 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 variables, the things that change that might affect our answer. So the, the perfect experiment eliminates all possible variables, all possible explanations except for one. And that's our hypothesis, and that's the one that we're trying to test. So we form our hypothesis. Hopefully, it's a hypothesis we can test or it has no value to us. And then we design and conduct the experiment where we collect the data. Here they say observe and record is step four. That's our experiment right there. So, and then here on the flow chart, we start our experiment, is it working? If it's working, yeah, we're gonna get our data out of there and then we're gonna analyze it and draw a conclusion. If it's not working, which happens a lot, then we gotta go back and say, okay, what's wrong with our process? <clears throat> what are we doing wrong? Let's fix it and redo it. And we get into this feedback loop, right? But, here, let's say it's working, analyze and draw conclusions. That's where we are here. Step five, draw conclusions. Our data are going to give us the answers. Our data analyzed properly are going to tell us whether we're right or wrong. So assuming we collected the data correctly, assuming we did our analysis correctly, used the correct st statistical analysis packages and accounted for all the uh, extended variables, we're going to get an answer. We're going to get a determination about whether a hypothesis was true or not. So once we do that, whether it was right or not, our duty as a scientist then is to share your findings, communicate your results. If your experiment didn't work, if it, if it proved that your hypothesis was wrong, you need to communicate that to other scientists so they know, oh, that they might have had the same ideas and say, okay, well, he's already tested that and that didn't work. So I, I got to go move on. Remember, we talked about had the more knowledge you had, the better off you are. So you've got to communicate the results. Was your experiment, did your experiment prove your hypothesis? Did your experiment disprove it? And along with that communication, you, you're communicating, this is how I did the experiment. This is how I collected the data. This is how I now analyze it. Here's, here are my data. You can take a look at it. Here's my analysis. You can take a look at it so that other scientists can look at it and make judgments uh, and find if you made mistakes can point out to you, hey, you made a mistake here. You made a mistake there. Or they can look at it and say, all right, well, he's covered that. We know now that that's not an explanation. We're going to have to go look someplace else. So one of the things in the John Oliver video they talk about is replication studies uh, and that they're very rarely done. And he's accurate there. They very rarely are done because they're expensive, time consuming, and there's not a lot of professional glory in redoing replication studies. However, the way that science works, current studies are based on previous studies. And the assumption that the previous studies conclusions were accurate. And if you base your current study on a previous study where the conclusion was inaccurate, the results are going to be wrong. And so when you start tracing back why your results are wrong, I did this right, I did that right, I did this right, eventually you get to the point of saying, oh, wait a minute, I based all this on the findings by Fred Smith several years ago. And it looks to me like Fred Smith was wrong. And so this is where you go back and relook at Fred Smith and redo his, uh, redo his, 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 his or you really look at his data and you reanalyze it. You might have to redo his experiments. That's how most experiments get verified, right? Instead of replication studies, essentially as science progresses and moves on, we always build science on the shoulders of previous science. 
if something's not working, eventually we look backwards or we look down to say, hey, was something wrong back there? So replication studies, uh, while they're not done, the process of science kind of does replication studies just by this uh, building on on uh, 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 on established experiments for future experiments. The other thing he talked about is that, um, and I hope you picked up on this, that very, very often when we do studies, uh, particularly medical studies or or carcinogenic studies or those kinds of things, we do them on mice uh, because mice are cheap and nobody cares. You know, if a mouse, if a lab mouse dies, if a lab mouse dies, at least we're trying to save people's lives and everything else. But he pointed out that it turns out a whole lot of the drugs that work on mice and a whole lot of the results that they get from mice simply aren't transmittable to humans. That it doesn't. Mice are different than humans, so. Often, positive result or a, a medication working on a rat or a mouse doesn't work when we try it on humans. Um, and that's just the way it is. And one of the ways that we're trying to make that so it's more accurate, the studies on, on mice and rats, is directly tied to your CRISPR-9 assignment that you did. With the, we can actually take genes and insert genes and things. And so... We now can produce what are called humanized mice, where we take a few human genes that are specifically involved in metabolizing of a drug or in, in, a, in a malfunctioning, causing a, a disease or something like that, and we put the human genes into the mouse cells. And genes produce DNA, and DNA is DNA. It's the same across all living things, uh, A's and T's and C's and G's. And so you put a human gene in a mouse cell and the mouse cell is going to read that human gene protein code and it's going to produce the human gene, the human protein. And so that allows us to have mice that respond uh, to drug tests or, or carcinogenic studies or those kinds of things much more accurately in terms of, of replicating what we might expect to see in humans. So those are just two, I wanted to follow up those two points from the John Oliver video. Science isn't always right. We're wrong all the time, but it's self-correcting. That's the cool part about it, right? It always moves on. It's always advancing. The next experiment comes up. The, 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 the data that you base your experiment or your conclusion on, more data is available now. We have brand new tools that have shown up, much more powerful computers, different statistical analysis, really complex lab machines that are incredibly uh, good at, at working in micro uh, uh, cosms and those kinds of things. And continued research advances in related fields, all those things lead us to continually be correcting science, what we got wrong. It's This is the way that we correct those things, right? It's not, it's never a given hard, this is what it is. We always are double checking and correcting when there are mistakes. Scientific thinking is based on one thing. How do you know that's true? How do you know it's true? When somebody tells you something, that's the a scientist says, oh, how do you know that's true? Where are your data? Where'd you get that information from? How do you know it's true? And science does have limits, man. We have no way. We can't devise a test. We can't devise any kind of experiment where we can prove the dis dis. We can either prove or disprove the existence of God. We just can't. And so that's completely outside of our realm. We don't even fool with that. That's the realm of the society and religion and everybody else. And faith is different than proof. And we don't care. We can't prove scientifically the existence of God and so we don't even get involved in that it's nothing doesn't have anything to do with science and even this esoteric things like un, what is elegance right we can't take a picture of something with a computer and say tell us if that's elegant or not we can't do that or what's beauty because beauty is every individual has different standards for beauty and there's nothing that kind of defines a universal what is beauty so the science is this incredibly powerful tool it's really, really great in a lot of ways, but it's not the answer to everything. It can't do everything. One of the places, though, where science runs into trouble is that 
when we do our research, we go through this process of this very methodical process of collecting uh, data objectively and observations and, and, anal and analysis. And we work really hard and even have numerical, statistical computer tests to make sure we're not letting our emotions control our emotions give us preconceptions or, or give us false answers about why something is, is happening, right? So it doesn't matter what your political beliefs are. It doesn't matter what your personal beliefs are. When you're doing science, science, the scientific method is designed to try and remove those personal beliefs and agendas from the conclusions that you're going to draw that does not sit well with people outside the scientific community. It's all about data. And if we're gonna talk about data, how did you collect it? And how do you analyze that? Because that's the core competency of science. Did you collect the data properly? Did you analyze the data properly? And that's what defines whether you made a good study or not. It's all based on how did you collect your data and how did you analyze your data. And if you do it wrong, a poorly designed study, it pops out all sorts of incorrect answers, right? When scientists critique other studies or other, science, uh, other, other research and other conclusions, very rarely do they focus on the conclusion. If they see the conclusion, they think that's wrong. All of their focus and all their effort then is to go back and look at their data and look at how they analyze their data. How do they collect their data? How do they analyze their data? Because if there's a mistake there, it's going to change the conclusion. We don't say, hey, you need to change your conclusion. We say, hey, you need to go back and look at your data. You're collecting it wrong, analyze it wrong, and that's going to change your conclusion. This is where science gets itself crosswise with politicians and religious leaders and personal beliefs of a whole lot of people. We talk about global warming or global climate change. The science is clear on that. We have, you know, gigantic amounts of data, literally terabytes and terabytes of data, gigantic amounts of data, all of which are used in determining, man, this is happening. And whether you like it or not, it's coming. And it's here now, and it's changing what's going on in the world. I don't care whether you believe it or not. I don't care if you want it to be true or not. I don't care if it's a political issue for you. It's not political. It's what's happening, and the data prove it. That's what science does. Now, science has gotten used to somebody turning around and attacking the scientist. You can't say that because, you know, I believe that you guys have some sort of secret cabal trying to destroy the economy of America by taking down the oil companies. Yeah, right. Okay. I got terabytes of data spread literally across, <laughs> across 800,000 years. You say it snowed in Tulsa yesterday and that <laughs> uh that that invalidates your <laughs> millions and trillions and trillions of data points, really, right? Science is pretty powerful, but science gets attacked all the time. And you see this in real life in vaccinating children and what vaccines are and how they work. And this has become a political issue, and it shouldn't be. This is a public health issue, right? It's not an individual choice issue. This is a public health issue. The data are clear on this. You're actually going to be doing an assignment on vaccination. So we'll let you figure that out. Evolution. Um, and that, that one's really interesting because when people talk about evolution, often it's coming from their perception of their religious beliefs. And the interesting part of that is most people who have uh, objections to to evolution based on their religion, based on their readings of the Bible. It turns out the things that they say aren't even the official stand of their specific religion. 
All right. So if you want to argue about evolution from a religious standpoint, the first thing you need to do is need to find out what your religion actually says about evolution. Uh, so, and I saw this firsthand when I was, was in graduate school at BYU and teaching classes, but there was the religion classes would send their students into the uh, lectures when we were talking about evolution and they would stand up in the middle of the class and, and wave a pamphlet around and challenge us. And we were going to hell because God said evolution and, you know, and God created man and not evolution and went on and on and on. Well, it turns out the religion department was teaching false doctrine according to Mormon. The Mormons say, hey, we don't know. We don't have a problem with evolution. That's probably, you know, who cares what it do? But the religion department actually had to get uh, president, uh, prophet of the church, sent a letter to the religion department, said, knock it off. We don't have a problem with, with evolution. And the Catholic church, go back and look what John Paul XXIII said about evolution. So if you got a problem with evolution and you're Catholic, then you need to, to ask God how come he let the Pope say the wrong thing, right? And you see a lot of this with the coronavirus. It doesn't matter what kind of research or study you're doing, all of it. Results and conclusions are all driven by data. And if it's well-collected data, we're going to get the truth. If it's poorly collected data, we're probably going to get a false reading. It's not going to be the truth, right? So it's all about collecting data properly and analyzing it properly. And that's, see, the fundamental problem is that's completely opposite of how the human brain wants it. You're a pack animal. You like to be around pack. And so you like to be around people that talk like you, look like you, and act like you, and have the same beliefs as you, and talk the same as you. That's just, you may think you're an individual, but you want to be around people that that you view, view as very, very similar to you. That's, you're a pack animal. And when somebody is outside that pack, then the tendency is to attack them as being inferior because they don't have the same belief and they don't dress the same and they're different color and whatever it is, right? And that's that's just kind of the way the human brain evolutionarily has been built. And that's that being in that pack was incredibly important to survival and carrying on. Unfortunately, that same drive, that same instinctive derive, drive that led to that kind of back instinct is also the things that lead to the political division we have in this country that lead to to racism in this country uh, and that's why it's so hard to 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 counter those um, social constructs is because they actually do have a background in evolutionary biology the good news is you got this big powerful brain that's more than capable of overcoming that in many people's case, the bad news is they don't want to. You, you will hear a number of key words when people are attacking science. And so originally started out as being, that's junk science. That's junk science, right? That's junk science. They did the science wrong. Maybe it was. We'll address that in a minute, right? Now, now it's just fake news. It used to be junk science. Now it's fake news. And for instance, if we look at global warming, you routinely hear these these politicians and non-believers talk about that this is a global conspiracy driven by scientists who want more funding to address a non-existent problem. Try explaining that to all the people who are getting wiped out by hurricanes, people who are dying because of the excessive heat, the fires that are going on are all much more severe. And the science is clear on those now with some new techniques we have. We can demonstrate that those storms are now much more severe, that those fires are much more damaging and more severe. And the differences are caused directly by humans uh, interacting with the environment, releasing excess carbon dioxide 
which is uh, the driver essentially creates more energy uh, by by warming and that drives that energy is what drives hurricanes droughts all those kinds of things so you always hear this it's a hoax it's junk science it's fake news when you hear that it's your responsibility to say all right why why is that junk science where are your data don't tell me it's junk science tell me why that science is wrong what did they do wrong how did they gather their data? Did they do that wrong? How did they analyze their data? Did they do that wrong? Because if you're going to claim it's wrong, it's your responsibility to produce evidence that it is wrong. <clears throat> Where are your data? Where is your analysis? You can take their data and analyze them. Exactly what's going on. When you disagree with science, that's okay. But it, then your responsibility is to use the scientific method prove that they're wrong. Don't just spout, no, oh, that's fake science. No. Why is that fake science? Is their data wrong? Did they collect it wrong? Did they analyze it wrong? Show me your data. Science always follows the data. We don't get to choose our answers. We don't get to choose our solutions. The data tell us the answers. <clears throat> So one of the really powerful tools we have that you see attacked all the time now is, is we call, we, when we build a model, and the model isn't like we're taking out glue and gluing together plastic pieces or we're getting out Legos and building something. It's a mathematical description of a system uh, that essentially if we it's done correctly and we have the right data in there and the right uh, interactions built into a model, it's going to be able to predict the future, what's going to go on. Given these circumstances, when this happens, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. That's what models are all about, trying to predict that. And you're you're very familiar with models. You just don't know them as models. The, the weather forecasts are completely built on models, right? And weather forecasting now is much, much, much more accurate than it was 10 years ago. It's, it's 50 years ago. It, it completely changed, right? Because it's much more accurate. And that's all built on because we've got a lot more sensors. We've got a huge amount of data from all over the globe. We can look at temperatures and cloud layers and water content and, and, and winds aloft and temperatures aloft and circulations. And all those things go into building these really complex models, right? And the cool thing about models is that they're not static. They don't stay the same. Once you build a model, uh, the world continues, data continues. And so you can watch your model and is it accurately predicting what's going on? If it is, okay. If it's not, things are, now we can go back in and tweak that model. Oh, we got to change this, the way it's dealing with this. We're too, not picking up enough heat out of the ocean. Okay, we can tweak that, we can tweak that. And so models just inherently get more and more accurate as more and more data are produced. And we continue to update these models and they get more and more accurate. And then the other cool thing about when you build a model is that you actually can withhold some of the data. Pull a chunk out of there, a couple months, a year, 10 years, whatever it is. So, you know, you don't get that. Then you tell the model, okay, go ahead and run the model. And give me, where you, let's say you pulled out the chunk from 1970 to 1980, all your data, pulled it out. Then you went to the, your model and said, okay, model, tell me what was going to happen. Tell me what's going to happen in 1970 to 1980. It doesn't know. Just got all the numbers up to 1970. So it runs a model. It says, here's your prediction. Now you take your 10 years of data. And you, how accurate was it? If it's dead accurate, your model's working really well. If it's not accurate, I got to go back and look through. Where did I make a mistake? Where are things wrong? And I tweak that and I do that again. And so models are really powerful because they're built on huge amounts of data. They're really powerful because they're continually updated. They're really powerful because they can be verified using actual data. All those things. I don't care if you don't believe it. I don't care if it says what you don't want to hear. Show me your data. So you're not a scientist. What do we care about the scientific method? Well, it turns out you use a version of that, which we call scientific literacy. And scientific literacy is really important in your life to help save you money keep you healthier, 
to help you understand world issues, become the person in the room with an actual informed opinion based on, on information and data. So scientific literacy is all about you applying just logical thought, just logically. And the more facts you have, the more information you have, the more knowledge you have, the better your logical thought press is, process is, right? So when you go about researching, gathering your facts, and you understand those facts, now all of a sudden you can apply that in logical thought, and that allows you to check things with your BS meter. Uh, this requires a little bit of effort on your part. So you are, the world has fundamentally changed. When I was growing up and when I was early in on my career, we spent a great deal of time tracking down and finding information, finding research. It was all published in journals, but they would be in multiple language in various places all over the world. And there was this process, this long detailed process where you'd go to a book called the Science Citation Index and look up citations and work your way backwards. Uh, it took a long time and you know, write to people, can I have this? Can I get that paper from you? All those kinds of things. The world fundamentally changed with the invention of the internet. The internet essentially was the third. So the third information revolution, the first of course was, was the invention of writing. All of a sudden you could share your ideas using writing. It didn't have to be verbal, so it could be shared across much greater groups. The second then, of course, was the printing press. Now I could share ideas in writing to vast numbers of individuals. I didn't have to handwrite each individual copy. The third, of course, would be radio and TV media, uh, allowing the instantaneous spread of information. And then the fourth now is the internet, which allows you unbelievable access to gigantic amounts of information at the touch of your fingers. That is absolutely incredible. It is also absolutely terrifying because it turns out not all information is accurate. Not all of it is good information. Some of it is designed specifically to alter your thought, to change your, change your opinions, um, uh, warp you into a, a personal sense of belief. So we want to have a way when you go looking for information on the internet, you really need to have a way to verify, Hey, is this good solid information? Or is this just somebody making something up? Cause they're trying to get in my pocketbook. They want me to vote for them or they want me to, you know, join their cult or whatever it is. So, how to spot fake news. And by the way, I put this graphic as a standalone in the canvas for you. This would be on an exam if somebody said, uh, hey, Fred Jacobs made a, a claim that donkeys are hybrids between zebras and uh, uh, dingo dogs. Okay, well, how are we going to evaluate that? How do you spot fake news? So the first thing you're going to do is consider the source, right? Click off that site, take the name of whatever, whoever, whatever it is, put that information out, stick that into Google and see what it comes up. How long they've been around? What's their mission? How are they funded? How do you get a hold of them? Right? If they're legitimate, there's got to be an easy way to get a hold of them. So that's the first thing you do is consider the source. Can you even determine the source? Do you even know where it came from? That's pretty important. Read beyond. Hey, if it just gives you a headline, don't stop there. Read the whole thing because it turns out, and I see this a whole lot, clickbait headlines say one thing. When you go in and read it, it turns out it's completely different. Uh, so make sure you just read beyond the headline to see what's going on. The third is check the author. So if you can determine who the author was, well, first of all, if you can't determine who the author was, that ought to tell you a lot about how credible it is, how how viable it is, right? 
But if you can determine the author, author do a quick search for them. Who are they? Do they have uh, credentials in the field they're talking about? Right? You often, this one of my favorite here is you always see, this is from Dr. So-and-so, and that's from Dr. So-and-so. Well, doctor of what? He's a doctor of divinity. He got his his his, his doctorate from essentially an online uh, uh, preacher school. That doesn't qualify you to be talking about uh, vaccinations. It just doesn't. Uh, what you really want is a doctor of public health, right? Somebody who knows what the heck's going on. So check for the author and see is, is it really a person and, and what are their credentials? And here, are they real? This is now getting into chat because a lot of these times now you're starting to see stuff produced by chat GTP. So and where did they get that? Chat GTP went online and found a bunch of, and you don't know where it found all that information from. So that's really a dangerous situation. So do they provide supporting sources? Whatever they're making the claims, do they say, you know, oh, this study here, and you, you can actually click on and access the study. It's such a, so check on those supporting sources. Does the information, the supporting sources actually support the story that the person's trying to tell you? Check the date. Just make sure you know when that thing was originally posted and when their information came from, right? Old news stories sometimes don't hold up. We want to look at it. We see this a lot. Politicians are notorious for this. They'll pick up a story and um, hurry and post it on X or Twitter, whatever you call it now, right? Or they'll put it on their Instagram. Hey, you know this? And it's a story they picked up and retweeted that originated in like the onion which is complete satire completely made up bs and they are they're acting like here's the end of united states civilization as you know it because you know whatever the most outlandish thing you can ever think of they're stating that as fact now because they didn't bother to check their sources and see oh it came from the onion they're just kind of it's just satire it's just a joke so Make sure you check your biases. You, you tend to hang out in what we call echo chambers. You tend to hang out in places where you seek out confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is when you have a particular belief and you, you seek out others that have that same belief or seek out information that supports that belief and you automatically reject any information that's contrary to your personal belief. And often with that rejection, comes ridicule and derision and, you know, kill the messenger and, and those kinds of things. So make sure, you know, step outside of your echo chambers every now and then. Check your biases. Are your beliefs affecting your judgment, right? So if you're if you're, you're a progressive or a liberal and you watch MSNBC, go look at Fox every now and then. Check your biases. See what things look like. You can always get to and ask experts, librarians, professors, right? You can find experts on the internet. You just got to track them down and look at their credentials. So make sure you do that. So these eight steps here are really important in how to, to spot fake news or determine junk science or, or outrageous claims that are being made. So you really need to be paying attention that and like i said you might need that kind of information to move later on so that's it for scientific literacy we will talk again soon have a good day